Hey, everyone, and welcome to the Monday Night Agronomist. I am not Lindsay Smith. However, my name is Kara Oostrous, and uh, I am going to be your host for tonight. Very excited to be here. And you know what? Looking at the comments, you guys are excited to be here, too, which always gets me uh, nice and pumped up. Looks like Wheat Pete is drilling wheat. Dr. Dave Hooker is putting wheat in the ground as well. And I Everyone, it seems like seasonally across the country is talking about how nice it is, especially in uh, in Alberta. I know in southern Alberta, it was just a gorgeous, gorgeous day. So uh, great, great to have all of you guys here. Before we get to today's show, I just want to thank our sponsors because, of course, we wouldn't be able to have our show without our sponsors. So thanks to Decisive Farming by TELUS Agriculture, The Canola School, and Adama Canada. While other sources of innovation run dry, Adama is here to deliver, leveraging the world's largest library of actives to provide innovative crop protection solutions to your greatest challenges. We're all in on you. Talk to your Adama sales rep today. Okay, let's get going here today. I'm going to bring in our guest, which I am super pumped to have here with me today as we are talking post-harvest scouting. I have here with me Keith Gobbert of the Canola Council of Canada and Michelle Dernan, who is with Herb Crop Advisory. How is it going, guys? It's just going really well. You uh, already hit the idea that we've had a beautiful day in Alberta. I spent the day, of course, cooped up in a basement office. But uh, yes, unseasonably good weather and most of the harvest is in the bin. It's been an excellent day here as well. Lots of combines rolling, lots of wheat going in the ground. And I was actually doing some post-harvest scouting today myself. Hey, that's what we like to hear. Timely. Um, it and I mean, when it's when it's so nice, though, at I don't get me wrong, I love a good like open fall. Fall is my favorite time of the year when we actually have it. But it seems like when that uh, snow comes, it's very abrupt. Then we go from like thirty degrees to minus ten, and it's a little bit of a shock to the system. So, uh, and, and as uh, Scott Gillespie is saying here, uh, his music, uh, our intro music, actually made him think of Christmas. So we're thinking about Christmas around here, I guess. I don't know. Christmas can hold on just a little bit. Okay. So, Michelle, do you want to tell uh, people that are watching? I believe this is your first time on The Agronomist. So do you want to tell people where they, wh where you are from and kind of the area you cover? Absolutely. So thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. I, um, I'm an independent agronomist with a small consulting firm based out of Huron County, Ontario. So we're just nicely located in southwestern Ontario, close to the lake. And uh, yeah, like I said, a great harvest day around here today. Awesome. And, and Keith, where do you cover? So Kara, I cover central Alberta. Well, it depends on your version of central. I cover Calgary to Athabasca. So a big chunk of, of the uh, dark brown, brown, even into the gray soil zone. So it's, uh, and didn't say black, sorry. So Canola Council Agronomist for the last 10 years, uh, cover, uh, I cover whatever canola field farmers phone me about. And I finally, for the first time this year, after telling growers at tours for 10 years that they should invite me to a good field, I actually had an agronomist come and say, hey, you gotta go look at this. It's on potato ground. I haven't seen a better canola field in my life. So so now I can say that they actually listen on a tour. And instead of seeing all the problem fields for canola, I've, I've actually been invited to one that I uh, I was excited about when I got to it. But, you know, being an agronomist is kind of like being a doctor. Like, how many super healthy people do doctors see? We don't typically take care of ourselves when, we, uh, when we're doing well. So, unfortunately, that's probably the same with agronomists as you get called in when things don't look so great. Absolutely. And uh, Michelle, you were out scouting today, doing some post-harvest scouting. What sort of crops were you looking at or what sort of stubble were you looking at? So today I was in soybean stubble that uh, the drill was closely following behind the combine, but the combine operator noticed that there were some dandelions and some green stuff out in the field. So I was out today to have a look and see what weed pressure we were dealing with and to see if it would be worthwhile to get that tidied up this fall before the wheat comes out of the ground. So 
definitely a, a good time to be scouting. I definitely always encourage the combine or the buggy drivers to be keeping an eye out in the fields as they're harvesting, and then they can get agronomists like myself, give us a heads up on what they're seeing and if we need to be there to help make that call. And, and I know that's exactly, I know I always got, I, I'm, I'm in pulse growing territory here. So I'm very familiar with the land ro- roller and I always got told growing up, you know, like that's where you really should be doing your agronomy scouting is from the land roller. Cause you can see what's emerging, what's not, is there any problems, but from the combine is just as crucial. We think, you know, end of season it's uh, let's just get this crop off, get it in the bin. Not much to worry about. Do you want to talk about why we really actually need to be getting in the ground and paying attention? Yeah, for sure. I mean, we deal with, you know, obviously a lot of perennials, um, especially as, you know, a lot of folks start to transition to more no-till or more strip-till and minimum tillage. Perennials definitely seem to become more of an issue and fall is an excellent time for us to control them. Those plants in the fall, they're driving all of their sugars and photosynthate into their roots so that they can overwinter. And so they're going to take the chemicals along down to the root system with them. So an excellent time to control them. And quite often we can do it with less chemistry than what we can in the spring, because in the spring, those plants are doing the opposite. So they're pulling everything from the root reserves upwards and it's just more difficult to control them. So great time to try and tackle them now. The main weeds that I'm looking for when I'm in fields right now are going to be dandelion because they're much easier to kill in the fall than they are in the spring. Um, Things like our thistles, sow thistle, really any of those tough perennial weeds that we don't always get a good opportunity to control in season. Now, what sort of crops, is there a specific one you scout that you find it's even more imperative that you're doing this, uh, that you're doing scouting after harvest? I wouldn't say one crop is more important than the other, but what I'll do here is I'll kind of run through the crops that I cover in our region and just give you an idea of what I'm looking for and what I might expect to see. So we are in an edible bean growing region. Um, And within the last few years, we've um, um, only had Aragon essentially as our desiccant that we can use. So glyphosate has been removed from the picture for the majority of the edible bean crop. And so quite often now when we're desiccating, you know, we are getting our annual broad leaves like our lamb's quarters and our ragweed, but without the glyphosate in that tank mix, Sometimes we're not getting a good kill on any dandelions or the other perennials that might be at the bottom of the canopy. So we'll be scouting those fields. Um, The majority of them are being planted to winter wheat. So we'll be scouting those fields after the edible beans come off going into winter wheat to see if there are perennials there. Same story exists in the soybean crop. So whether they're IPs or they're Roundup Readies, Quite often, it's still nice to get out there this time of year just to see if there are any perennials that need to be tidied up. And quite often, if we know the field history, we know which fields we should be checking. You know, some will just have more pressure than others. One that we don't think of as often is our cornfields. And I think because typically we're later getting to harvest our corn and often we do get bad weather. But if you think about it, those cornfields are typically the ones that are going to be going to your beans next year, where we don't have quite as strong of chemistries to control some of those perennials. So, you know, I love it if we get a nice open fall where we have an opportunity to get out there after the corn is off and tidy up some of those perennials. So that's what I'm looking for right now in terms of weed control with post-harvest scouting and we'll be coming up once the corn comes off. Um, We're looking at silage fields right now as well for the same thing. Keith, do you want to elaborate on the canola side of things? Why, Why that fall weed control can really be crucial and what you might be looking out for in your territory? Yeah, so I, I think uh, Michelle covered it really well. The, the fall, there's a fall window where especially glyphosate works exceptionally well. You can use a lower rate and get better results uh, either pre-harvest or post-harvest. 
And the really important thing for some of the listeners to, to realize, and I'm sure they realize this anyway, is that many of the areas in the prairies haven't had a killing frost. So we still have a really large window for a post-harvest application for glyphosate, even on some hay fields that maybe uh, regrew. So we see some we see some really odd things on fields that aren't taken care of the year before. So that post-harvest scouting for weed control is important, especially in open canopy like canola, where the leaves kind of come off and sometimes the pods don't cover the ground or intercept all the light. We'll see a lot of dandelion and some, some perennial weeds try to get started under there. So if you don't have a good system in place to get rid of those in the rest of your rotation, that might be an important thing to realize. Uh, we haven't had much for rain, which is kind of a key key indicator, not a key indicator, but it's, it really helps if we can get that stubble washed and the leaves of the weeds that we're trying to kill cleaned up a little bit and really haven't had that across much of the prairies. So it uh, really rained in June and kind of forgot how to do that ever since then and through July, August, and September. Uh, so so dust and, and dirt and, and, and contamination on some of those leaves might be an issue, but still well worth doing that post-harvest weed control. But specifically for scouting and canola, one of the things that growers have a hard time remembering or, or, or planning through is how to take the results from this year's canola crop and make sure it applies to the next time they grow canola on that particular piece of land. So in particular for diseases, it's really important to know the crop history and, and the results you had on this year's canola crop when you're coming back three years from now or four years from now or whatever your crop rotation might be. Uh, you can learn a few things about the crop with a nice, simple, easy walk through that field It'll tell you about, particularly about your stand, if you're doing a plant count, how well did your seeder do the job for you? Did you spend the right amount of money on seed and did it, did it come up and your percent germination, emergence and survival? You really need to know that to evaluate your seeder. But the big four diseases in terms of black leg, club roots, sclerotinia, verticillium, it's important to look at that stubble to understand what you're going to do the next time you come back to that field. Because I, I joke with growers, and it's not really a joke. If, if you don't have a clear picture of what your disease pressure is in that field, you shouldn't grow canola. And, and that's a pretty brave statement to make, but it's a really easy thing to get if you have control of that land the last time it drew canola. You should know it's my primary problem with disease black legs. And if so, we've got some tools in place to manage it. If club roots a real issue, well, we have some rotation lengthening issues and, and some genetics that we can probably deploy to help you manage it. If sclerotinia is an issue, well, you should know that. And if verticillium is an issue, you need to scout and, and understand that too. But it's not the kind of information you can gather next year or the year after on a non-canola year when you're thinking about, gee, I wonder how much canola I'm going to grow uh, the next time I get back here. Now, talk about clipping those stems. Like you, you go across a field with a combine and you're left, whether you're straight cutting or you're swathing, you still have those big canola stalks. Do you want to talk about why you might want to go out there and clip those stems? Absolutely. So you were mentioning the best time to scout a field was with the land roller. Um, and I think with a swather, it has the same sort of perspective. The narrowest implement that you have is actually the best thing that you can scout with. And and you should probably ride it yourself and make sure you drink a lot of water so you're inclined to get out and check those poor patches. So if you're, if you're going across the field and you find some patches that just aren't performing or they're, they're a little thinner than they should be, or maybe you have some weed growth that you just isn't normal for the rest of the field, that's an indication that the crop didn't use the fertilizer package and the nutrients that were available and the weeds took some of it. Or, or, or maybe you've just got a, a, a patch of canola that just turns into powder or fluff as you go through it with a combine or the swather. If you get out and take a look at those plants and pull them out, and, and I've, I've scouted right into snow, uh, as, long as, it's, as long as the ground isn't froze so I can actually pull those plants out, you don't get as clear a picture, but the picture you do get if you're still scouting then, if you can pull those stems out, I start a little lower now than I did at the start of my career because if we're looking for verticillium, we can look sort of an inch lower than the black leg cut for, uh, for discoloration. So I start a little lower, I'm looking for verticillium, I get into that I get into that main area where the roots turn into stem where it's still a really solid mass of tissue and cut there and if I have a nice clean white cross section green tissue around the outside I give myself a big check mark no black leg concerns in that field now it's a little tricky to describe verticillium versus black leg over the radio for you but we got some great resources on the canola encyclopedia and good pictures and, and such to, to look at 
But blackleg is one of those things that's that's painfully obvious if you've actually cut stems. So steal some pruning shears, pull a few plants in more than one spot in the field, and chances are you've got nice, clean, white cross sections. Now, if you're scouting right up until it snows and you don't have a nice, clean cross section, well, it could be any number of of rot pathogens that may have got in there in, in some of it's dying slowly. Um, so, you know, the best time to, to cut those stems would be sort of right at swathing time when they should be alive and white and clean, uh, healthy tissue. So from swathing right up until freeze up, you can get a good look and decide what kind of risk there is. And, and clean white stems at any point in that time window gives you, uh, gives you at least a check mark that black leg is into concern in that field in the season that you're scouting. Uh, now, Pete has a question here, Keith, that says, do you scout for residue spread? So many combines do a very poor job. And he writes, mine included, by the way. Um, any any thoughts there? So I always tell growers that the seeding prep starts with their with their straw chopper. So um, I when, when asked a few years ago what the most important piece of equipment on the farm was, and, you know, what, what would I, how would I answer that question? I, I said straw chopper, you know, it's a no, it's, it's a no brainer answer because the trash levels that we see out of a really good crop, which is what we'd like to see every grower get, uh, can be a real problem for seeding into. So canola, perhaps not so much under most conditions, we get really good shatter on, on that stubble and, and a good spread. Uh, but yes, absolutely. You should be looking for what kind of trash management issues you've caused yourself because if you have a cedar that's going to go through the field next spring and act like a baler and build that wad of soil and trash and stems up underneath uh, you're going to have an unhappy equipment operator so so yes absolutely uh, trash spread and trash management is i think job number one on the farm um, now Joanna Lindboom, who is actually on the agronomist, I believe it was last week, she did a great job. So uh, she's got a question here that we, I'm going to direct here to Michelle. What about scouting for harvest losses? Last year we saw every missed soybean germinate. Was this an abnormal loss year or just a visual of the beans we lose on a regular basis? Do you have any thoughts there, Michelle? That's an excellent question and definitely something that I think we should be mindful of. We had a pretty unique experience up in my region last year. We had some hail beginning of September. And so we actually were out scouting to assess harvest losses um, with the hail. But to answer Joanna's question, I definitely do think that, especially as the combine operator, I would want to be taking a look at the field afterwards and make sure that I've got the combine <laughs> dialed in so that I'm not spitting more out the back end than what I should be for sure. I would say it's not something that maybe I do as good of a job of as I could, but especially because I may not be following the combine directly, right? But I definitely think that I would probably gear that more towards the combine operator as something to be cognizant of. And, and as a follow-up to that, Pete's got a question that I'm going to direct to you again, Michelle. How cold or what parameters do you use when it comes to how late would you spray? That's a, that's a really good question. So, you know, last night we had, I guess, depending where you are, you experienced some degree of frost. We had a very, very light frost last night. And so once we get that first kind of frost of the season, I, I love to see that because after that, I know we're going to get a great kill of our perennials because they get that frost and they really start thinking about going into winter mode and driving, you know, those sugars downwards. Um, but how late can we spray? So ideally, we still want to be spraying our herbicides when the plants are actively growing. So we do still want to see some warmer daytime temperatures. That said, you know, I have sprayed things when they've been relatively cold, probably colder than what they should be. Um, products like like glyphosate, I would say, would be the one that I would spray the latest and still get the best bang for my buck out of. Um, but I have sprayed that, you know, relatively cold temperatures, five degree days, still had good success. Ideally, you know, we still want to see nighttime temperatures above three degrees, though, 
in order to uh, to ensure that we're going to get a good kill on some of those perennials. As we get into the colder temperatures, um, some of our group fours are going to be less effective than what they are now when we do have warmer temperatures and things are actively growing. So then it just becomes a matter of what's the best product for the job. And and any difference with glyphosate versus hormone versus contact? For sure. So this time of year, I personally, you know, like to use a combination of glyphosate with some of those hormonal herbicides. Um, nice to get a couple different modes of action and uh, definitely good on our flea beans and some of those tougher to control weeds. Uh, contact herbicides, not really something that I personally look at for the fall because typically I am going after the perennials that are going to take something that's systemic. And uh, Keith, what what would you say when it comes to how late would you spray, cold parameters? Because, I mean, it is a little different in the West, and w especially when you're dealing with canola. Yeah, so it, it's not really a canola question that, that, uh, that you're asking there. And our glyphosate suppliers actually have some pretty good recommendations. It's really specific things. My memory is telling me temperatures above five degrees, even if you've had a light frost that day, but if you're spraying into warming temperatures, the temperature currently is at five and rising, uh, we tend to see our glyphosate manufacturers saying, hey, you can you can probably still expect pretty good performance out of this. I guess the decision there is, and there, so there are some pretty specific examples, and I looked at my cheat sheet real quick here to see if I had them, and I don't, but my memory tells me five degrees or warmer and rising, even after a light frost, Michelle touched on it. You do want living green tissue for that, that product to be absorbed and, and actually move down into the roots. And a light frost tends to put the plants, I won't say puts them in panic mode, but it, it definitely drives everything that's left in that plant that those leaves can pick up down into the roots. So we see some pretty good activity. And the flip side for many producers is if they haven't got it sprayed by that point, they need to look at, well, what are my spring options? And is a liter or a liter and a half of glyphosate or even half a liter of glyphosate going to do a better job at 50% efficacy than the options that I can do in spring? And, and often the answer is yes. So if you're between a rock and a hard place and the temperatures are, are colder than you'd like, uh, we still see some pretty good efficacy and we tend to, tend to sort of, um, it, it's safer than going to Vegas, let's put it that way, in terms of will you get results uh, from spray and glyphosate late? Um, but follow the manufacturer's recommendation is the safe answer, uh, but you can spray it pretty late and still see some really nice results out of it. Uh, but, but a little more forethought and planning probably avoid that. I don't know, Keith, I, I really like agriculture and I really like farming, but some days I think I'd rather go to Vegas. So <laughs> well, I, I don't know what the right answer is there, mm -hmm. but, um, so Speaking of, you had mentioned how dry it was this year. Specific areas really didn't get any rain. Jeff Nielsen is uh, in one of the areas that can can get quite dry. He said, how does dust from the combine affect spraying? It's very dry here, so there's lots of dust cover. Yeah, so I, I kind of covered that already. One of the one of the things that you should be concerned about that you have absolutely no control over is that dust on these leaves will reduce glyphosate efficacy and and uh, waiting for rain isn't really an option so it's uh it's a matter of it's a matter of weighing your odds and, and deciding to do it anyway but dust reduces efficacy on almost all the products that you would consider spraying in fall here now Michelle, we touched on the canola side, some of the rots you're looking for within the stem. Talk about some of the rots you might be looking for in some of the crops you're scouting. For sure. So probably our edibles and our soybeans would be the two main ones where I would be looking for some of those rots similar to what Keith was discussing on the canola side of those. Now, the difference is that typically I'll be assessing those stands when we still have got a crop in the field, because that's certainly gonna be the easiest for us to see um, what I'm looking for. So a big one this year that I noticed in certain areas that I cover in soybean was sudden death syndrome. And I think I sent in some photos here that Jay might be able to pull up for us, but um, 
not a new disease by any means, but certainly something that we're starting to see more of is sudden death syndrome. And so I had a grower with some beans in his field that were staying quite green compared to the rest of the field. And so I went out and had a look at them. And these were fairly typical of our sudden death syndrome symptoms. So we're seeing these plants continue to hold on to, um, you know, their green color. And one really distinguishing feature with this disease compared to other ones is you'll see if you look in closely that the leaves have started to fall off in places but the petioles are still hanging on so those are what those branches coming off the side are those are the petioles that hold on to the leaves so that's a definitely a distinguishing feature of this disease this time of year um now if you get to the get to the field and you're harvesting and you know obviously the entire field looks mature if and we've kind of passed this point of identifying the sudden death syndrome, I would really pay attention to areas of the field where on your combine yield monitor, you're seeing the yield lower than what you would expect it to be because that can be associated with sudden death syndrome or sorbine cyst nematode amongst other things, but it's certainly still good to make note of. And if you have got harvest yield data to maybe send that on to your agronomist and then you can do some diagnostics moving forward. But that was a big one that I noticed this year. Certainly white mold in soybeans and the edible bean crop is always a biggie. Um, not as big this year because we were fairly dry throughout the flowering period, I think in a lot of the province. So not something we saw as much of this year, but on a typical year, definitely something we see and again it's really good to make note of those areas or if you've got your your yield data to maybe share that with your agronomist because there are things that we can start to do in terms of playing around with dropping the seeding rate in those areas or managing with the fungicide so like keith said it's very good to make notes of these things because the next time three or four years down the road that you get to the same crop on this field you'll have long forgotten about it but if you have got those records there to fall back on then you can plan and avoid that situation or help to um you know reduce it in the future and, and jason jones says some of that for us ended up being brown stem rot as well do they look quite similar is that uh something else you've seen a lot of this year Brown stem rot, um, charcoal rot is something that we think we've seen yet. I don't want to say for sure um, as I haven't, you know, sent it to the lab, but yes, um, have seen some plants just look like they've died prematurely with their leaves hanging on. Um, but a good thing to do is start to, you know, look at the base of the stem, look at the roots. And if you're unsure, because some of these diseases can be a little bit more difficult to diagnose, it is always a good idea to send them to the lab for the correct diagnosis. Okay, that seems like a good spot. I am giving Lindsay a run for her money here by uh, taking over a half an hour to get to our first clip. So uh, I think it's time to show our first clip, Jay. It's hard when we have a great uh, conversation going on. So if you could play that, Jay, that would be superb. <laughs> We go in right after harvest and we do some plant uh, stand counts. And we do that, that's actually the second timing that we do it. And I think it's a really good opportunity. Um, it doesn't take long. Um, and if you're not sure how to do it, the Canola Council has some great videos, but it's a really good opportunity to look at um, one of the things that can really drive what went wrong or what went right with your canola crop the past season. So what are, you what are you going to be looking for when you're out in the field and you're looking at those stems? So we're looking at uh, for like an optimal plant stand, which is around five to seven plants per square foot. Um, something that I did see this year in some of my trials even is that, uh, you know, we had some late se seeding. Um, soils were really warm. Conditions were great. So we didn't adjust our survivability and we ended up with... Um, greater than seven plants per square foot. And while this didn't affect some uh, some of our plots, some of our plots, did we did see lodging. And so I think lodging was something experienced by growers in different regions across the West. And for sure, plant uh, stand can be something uh, that's a contributing factor. And so it's good to look at that because if you have new equipment 
or maybe you were dealing with conditions that were a little bit different this spring, it's great to go back and look to see what your plant stands were to see if that was one of your contributing issues. On the flip side, though, maybe you did have an ideal plant stand. You were right with the, in that five to seven plants that we're looking for, and you still saw some lodging or maybe even some disease. Um, and that can be another good thing to identify because it usually indicates that there's probably something else going on in your crop other than just plant stand. And thanks to our show sponsors again. Before we get back into it, I just, like I said, I want to thank our show sponsors. We have Adama Canada Decisive Farming by TELUS Agriculture and the Canola School. Your soil has a unique story at Decisive Farming by TELUS Agriculture. We get that. Let's optimize your fertilizer costs and replenish your soil by tailoring your nutrient plants to your field's needs. Visit DecisiveFarming.com to learn how to get soil health insights today. Okay, so watching that video, one thing, uh, selfishly, of course, I see myself and I go, okay, my hair might change, my face might change, but this hand talking is never going to change. So <laughs> that's always a part of my videos, I guess. And uh, I find a lot of times I'll be interviewing people and they say, you know, what do I do with my hands? I'm like, I don't know, flail, flail them around. It's what I do. <laughs> Um, so in that video, we talked about plant stand counts and kind of how this plays in the canola world. Michelle, do you want to talk about plant stand counts in soybeans and how you For might sure. be doing that post-harvest? For sure. Truthfully, soybean stand counts are something that typically we're looking at, you know, in the springtime, a few weeks after planting because there's a number of different things that we'll be able to look at then that we might not see now. So if we have, um, say, poor planter performance, for example, where we're not getting our seed deep enough into the ground and we've got some beans that are sitting in dry dirt, that's something that we're gonna be able to see in the springtime, but maybe not now. Um, and same goes with if we have insect pressure, that's certainly something that we'll see in the spring, but wouldn't necessarily see at harvest. One thing that we definitely will see at harvest and uh, an interesting conversation that I had with the grower the other day, he you know, typically is planting a relatively low seeding rate across a number of his acres but did have to go in and replant on some of his heavier ground. And so his comments were, you know, on this ground where I went back and replanted and had a much higher population, my yield is quite a bit better. And so obviously there is different factors going on here, but his realization was, uh, I think on this heavier ground, maybe I need to reassess my um, populations. So that's a good thing to look at this time of year for sure. Maybe not something that I'm going to see when I've got boots on the ground, but definitely something for a combine operator to be aware of. On the corn side of things, I think that there is a little bit more that we can see this time of year. You know, same story. We're obviously going to be out scouting in the spring, and that's when we're going to be identifying any of those planter issues or some of the early season pests. This time of year, however, um, you know, I was in a field a few weeks ago that had some serious goosenecking uh, that certainly looks like it's um, caused by insect damage. And so those are different kinds of things that we may see when we're in the fields this time of year. And, and Keith, do you want to elaborate a bit more on some of the things Jeanette said there when it comes to looking at your plant stands? I know we talked a bit about when you're going through the swather and how you might see the uh, lower areas, but what else is a producer looking for? Well, I think on corn and beans, it's uh, uh, quite a bit different than canola. You probably can sort of think about planting one seed to get one plant. Uh, with canola, we think about bad as it sounds, we think about planting two seeds to get one plant um, because our germination percentage ranges somewhere between 25 and 90 percent. Uh, and soil conditions can really play into that. Trash management can really play into that. But looking from the road, three plants per square foot looks pretty good or can look pretty good. So 
um, if if you're not actually counting those plants or you know that your boot is 12 inches long and you're on 12 inch spacing and you go in and take a look at how many plants you have it's really hard to decide if you can tweak your seeding operation so you're looking at seed that's 15 dollars or more a pound uh, you're looking at a seeding rate that probably calculates out somewhere in the, in the range of five pounds per acre um, and we're using the thousand kernel weight we're trying to get you to be a little more precise on seeding but if you don't know if you're in that 40% emergence ballpark or in that 75% emergence ballpark, or maybe you're in the 90, you really don't know if you've got a pound or two of seed that you can we can play with. Um, so growers that, that really want to be a little more precise and manage that crop a little better, and that can, in the clip, for example, mention that they'll see some lodging issues if you're over seven plants per square foot for some of these varieties, and it's not recommended to be on, a, on the high range. Uh, if you haven't done those counts, you really have no way of tweaking your operation or your seeding operation. Um, and, and I like to tell growers that they should be changing their seeding rate as they move through seeding. Maybe, maybe not every field, but, you know, if you start seeding on April the 28th, which is pretty early for most of us here, into cold, wet soil, you probably need an extra pound of seed to sort of give yourself the, the um, benefit of, of, of the doubt or to, to get past some of that stress. And, expected poor emergence but two weeks later when you've been rained out by half an inch of rain and things are things are about as good as they can be for seeding operations i'd love to see it if you would actually look at it and say well here i'm i normally get 60 and i'm pretty confident i'm going to get an extra of 10 15 percent and i'm going to steal a half a pound here because the number that i don't like growers to tell me when i ask them what's your seeding rate they say 4.6 pounds i'm like how did you get that he said well this many acres this many bags you can you can definitely have a little better idea of what your seeding rate and seeding results can be than uh, than just acres divided by bags at the end of the season and the best way to do that is counts so whatever kind of hoop you've got if it's fancy canola council fabric yellow one great if not steal your kids hula hoop grandkids hula hoops and, and go out and do some of those counts because until you actually stand in the field and look you don't really know if that seeding operation, which essentially sets your yield. I'd like to say that the most important pass over the field is that seeding operation, because from that point on, you kind of, I don't want to say it's downhill, but if you do a poor job of seeding, it's really hard to compensate for that. And canola is fantastic at compensating. So sometimes that plant count doesn't really correlate that well to yield. So we have a pretty wide range of plant counts but given a good season, a season where the plant can can act like that weedy relative that it is and, and, and put on more pods, put a few more flowers out, produce that yield. If you get that kind of a season, you can make a few mistakes and, and get through it. But if you get a year like 2022, where it was perhaps a little too dry for three weeks and then a little too wet for four or five weeks and then a little too dry or a little too hot for the next five or six weeks, that crop doesn't can't make up for any of the errors that we might have tossed at it during the season so you need to do the best job you can at seeding and then manage it as well as you can afterwards now tossing aside specific crop types another thing you're looking at when you're doing that post-harvest scouting is your soil michelle do you want to talk a bit about digging through the soil what sorts of things are you going to be looking for um and and why is it really important that we're actually taking a look at that soil in the fall for sure. So this is a great time of year to get your soil sampling done, especially after we have had, at least in Ontario, had some rains to soften up the ground a little bit. But it is a really good time. Uh, you know, I can learn a lot with, you know, an eight inch soil probe, basically telling me how mellow that ground is or if we've got some compaction there in the top, right? So definitely going to learn a lot there. And I think just to get on that program of soil sampling in the fall every three years is obviously very good to look at your fertility management program as well, right? And Lara Demozak says anytime you can get a sample is a good time. She is a soil scientist, so she loves her soil. <laughs> um, definitely. I'm sure most people would agree with that, Lara. That's awesome. Um, Keith, if you've seen clubroot, the dreaded clubroot in your field, and 
you maybe didn't do anything about it. I'm sure this happens in some instances. What can we be doing in the fall time? Is there any sort of sampling we can be sending out or calling your agronomist? Or do you have any recommendations if you had seen it in the field during the year? Yeah, so um, I don't want to say it's never too late to, to manage or look for club root. Um, one of the things that you'll see this time of year, and it's really predictive in, in my experience, is that you'll see some weed growth in club root patches. So un unfortunately, one of the first times I was introduced to club root years ago, we three of us were scouting. And by the time one of us would fill out the, the form for what GPS we were at, uh, the next guy would probably have found a patch the size of a kitchen table because there's wild buckwheat growing in patches in the field and that's where the club root is. So looking for weed growth is pretty important. Just looking for normal roots. So at this time of year, whether you've got a cereal or a soybean or a corn, you, you may not see how healthy white roots, that's not your expectation, but you do expect to see roots when you pull the crop up. And on club root, if you pull the, if you pull the, um, if you pull the canola out of the ground and the roots aren't there, those side branches are missing, the, you got maybe some peat moss looking material there, that's those galls that are decomposing. You might not be able to find those white solid galls that, that you might have otherwise, but simply uh, this time of year to kind of uh, delineate the patch. So you may not have done that when it was hard to walk through four foot high canola, because even at 50% infection with club root, you still have a decent looking crop in July and August. So now that you've got stubble, you can sort of pull some roots and figure out where that patch extends to or how big it is. Uh, if you're able to, you can pull those uh, roots out and bag those galls. Now that really should have been done earlier because once they've decomposed and they're being left behind, you're leaving all that seed behind there. There is some patch management techniques that you can use, which would include treating it with lime, uh, really should incorporate it that, but then you've got the risk of handling that soil and maybe moving it. Um, I like to joke that producers should go get a, a big rock or a pile of posts from the, from the yard and throw it in the middle of the patch because the typical thing that we see with club root is that, especially for a grower that finds it for the first time, is they really panic as they find this patch. They begin to understand that this disease can really just take 100% of the yield away from some plants uh, if, it, if it attacks early and severely. But by the time next spring rolls around and you're rolling through with a 42-foot flexicoil cultivator or, or, or cedar or, or even wider, the odds of you wanting to go around a small patch are pretty low. You've got barley or wheat or peas in the tank, and you're not thinking about club root next season. And to drive home the idea to growers when they're scouting now is that that single, that single plant with a decent amount of galls on it, if I were to change it into club root spores, or if I change the club root spores into canola size seed, so a little bit hard to imagine on the radio, but imagine I move my magic canola wand, and instead of being microscopic for spore size, they're now the size of canola seed one of those plants can easily produce about two super bees worth of canola seed if it were a club root, if club root spores were the size of canola. So leaving those plants, those galls, those stems, where they cause disease and where the disease is present is really important because dragging a couple of those stems a half a mile away and dropping them in a low spot where there's a little more moisture and a little more conducive for club root means you've just spread that patch. Uh, and my experience with club root has been that when you find a pretty significant patch and you begin to manage it through genetics, uh, particularly if you stay on a relatively tight rotation, those patches come back in exactly the same spot. So the kind of disease causing pressure that's in a club root patch, it, the, the selection pressure there is so strong on the varieties that you put into it on a short rotation that those patches come back and then we're dealing with a resistance breaking pathotype. So, so figuring out a way to stay away from those patches or manage those patches or understand those patches or just skip moving soil out of them is pretty, pretty important. And we haven't, we haven't done a good enough job of convincing growers that. Yeah, absolutely. That was, uh, yeah. Do you, Michelle, do you see any, like I know in the West when we're growing pulse crops, we worry about a phantomyces. Is that an issue in the East on edible beans? That's, not something that we really worry about, likely, um, the same as you do out there. Okay. Okay. That's just what I often think of when I think club root in canola. I start thinking of phanomyces in our pulse crops because that's a, a bad one as well. 
before we're, we're very quickly running out of time here, but it is a time of year that, you know, as well as your post harvest scouting, you are trying to get the last year crops off the field. You're busy doing, uh, getting your crops into the bin. Um, another thing I wanted to bring up was storage. If you're Keith, maybe start with us here. If you're bringing some canola off the field that might not be in ideal conditions, what should you be doing when it comes to storing it? Well, getting it a bin that has cables or some kind of monitoring system is really, really critical. Um, and it's, it's a combination of temperature and moisture. So one of the big concerns in the prairies this past couple of weeks is that we took a lot of this canola off very warm. So when you have great harvest weather, that's not actually good storage temperatures. So aerating that material, pushing some cool air through it, maybe cycling those, uh, some loads out of those bins and just checking them. Uh, there's nothing like actually looking at that seed as it goes by you. Just pulling a load out, uh, taking the cone out of some of those bins or just leaving them in a, in a truck, leaving that, that one load you pulled out in a truck and putting it back in can really break up that heating cycle and, 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 and allow you to have a really good understanding of what the conditions are like in that bin. So getting things down so that they're cool and dry is really important. And they probably went into the bin dry and hot. So temperature management is likely the biggest concern now. We do see some straight cut uh, fields where there's some green material, some, some trash, some just some things that shouldn't be in the sample. Sometimes those will bunch up against a wall or, or make a pocket in the bin of what yeah. otherwise would be really easy to store canola. <laughs> Grasshopper legs, yeah, all kinds of stuff can, can be in that sample. So understanding that some of your chaff could be really hard to store and cause you to have, cause you to have more issues than you, than you realize. So um, it's a really valuable crop. It's important that once it's in the bin, you don't forget about it. That's, 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 that's the best advice. And, and Michelle, when you're storing in a bin, are you looking at, like, do you tell producers they need to, I, I realize the storage isn't quite the same in the East as it is in the West, but if you're putting it into a green bin, are, how often are you recommending that producers are going out and turning that bin? You know what, that's an excellent question and probably not something that I'm going to give you the best answer on. I don't focus a ton on the storage side of things. But that said, and, and I think maybe it's a little bit different here than in the West, we do have a lot of commercial elevators, um, you know, in local farming communities. And for the most part, you know, if you're someone who's new to storing grain on your farm, most of the employees or the owners there are more than happy to give you a good explanation of best storage practices. So I always try and direct questions like that to, you know, the co-ops of the world or those, um, you know, smaller, smaller grain businesses because they've been through this. They've done everything the wrong way and they know what to do properly. So definitely those would be the guys to help you out with those questions. Okay. Uh, Keith, do you have anything to add to that from the Western perspective? Well, I think we're already on the tail end of harvest, but sometimes it really helps to remind growers to take a really good sample. You know, there's there's no substitute for for having a really good sample so you know what's in that bin. Uh, so so that would be that would be the other the other factor. If you're still putting it in the bin, uh, particularly if you're kind of wondering if it's if it's if it's safe to do so, having that sample to really nail down what what you've put in the bin is important. And uh, and and that's. And, and if you're asking questions about storage, that's a pretty good indication you need to go out and check your bin. That's, that's a good rule of thumb. Always good to be checking in with the end user where you are going to be delivering the grain to and just asking them what they've been seeing, the grain that's becoming been coming in because they will be aware of problems that you may be facing before you are because they probably have other producers with those same issues. And, and switching gears, sorry, I realize we're kind of jumping around here, but I mean, it is end of season and that's what we seem to do. There's so many topics to cover, but uh, Joanna has a really good question here that I want to make sure we address. She says, how does SCN sampling differ from club root sampling in fall? How late can you sample for it? I guess, 
So on on the SCN side of things, obviously, I want to be, you know, sampling as close to harvest as possible, for sure. Um, how does that look for, for Club Root? Then you obviously want to be doing, you know, essentially the same, or you, you even said earlier in the season, you want to be sampling for it. Keith, maybe you have some thoughts. Yeah, so Club Root, Club Root spore levels testing um, can be done, I, I would say, anytime. In fact, we also often see some, sorry, I, I can't seem to get myself centered in the screen. Um, we, we often see that there's a, a little bit of a, of a anomaly as those galls break down and enter the soil. So you may get lower results than you expect. So testing, testing that soil um, the next season at, at any point, the, the difference is that you're probably not going to pull a standard soil sample uh, to test for clubber. You're going to test the top couple inches, zero to three, uh, in that patch. Completely different area than you're going to be looking at for any other sample. This is a specific to a disease sample. The other clubber sampling you might be doing is sending those galls away for confirmation, um, which which is a good idea to do. But but uh, it's it's pretty obvious. Pathologists are nice to us. Black leg looks black. Club root looks like a club. Um, it's it's but but that second party confirmation is is always nice. One of the things I would uh, stick in Kara in terms of scouting is for those growers that are thinking about where they're growing canola next year. Uh, one of the things I, I like to remind them of, of is they can look at their canola stubble from previous years, and if they're finding a lot of canola stubble, particularly well, most importantly, if they see some black leg uh, spore bodies, so some little black bumps that look like dirt but don't rub off. So they're not they're not gray or brown and, and color your soil perhaps. But when you rub those those root pieces that are still not decomposed after three or four years, and and those spore little bumps are still there, they look like sandpaper. Um, that's an indication you had black leg the last time you were there. It probably indicates that that's a disease you would want to manage a little more aggressively uh, coming into the next season. So Kind of an odd thing, but you can scout for black leg in your wheat crop before canola if you're if you're looking at the at the residue. And on that note, uh, Jason Bow has a question. He says, "What are you seeing with verticillium stripe in canola as well as black leg?" I think we have a lot more issues happening in southern Manitoba. So, yeah, as as you know, Jason is in southern Manitoba. What's the situation look like central Alberta? Yeah, so we haven't seen a lot of verticillium diagnosed in Alberta. Um, I believe it's present uh, much more than we than we realize. The symptoms are a lot more subtle than than they seem to be in, in Manitoba. So when I drive to Manitoba and take a look at some of the verticillium fields there, you know, you can you can see those microsclerotia. The stems shred fairly easily. They they fall apart. Easy to see in a cross section. That's that sort of star pattern for for growth or plugging off of the, the xylem in, in the stem. Um, the symptoms that I've seen from, from, I would say Lethbridge through to Red Deer area for verticillium are, are much less obvious. There's a slight discoloration to the stem, perhaps some vertical striping. When you cut those roots, it's a bit of a gray discoloration, sometimes a classical starburst pattern. But I guess, the, the take home message in Alberta is that it's really easy to miss verticillium and we're still probably less convinced that it's an issue than, than Manitoba. In Manitoba, they're very convinced that this is a, a potential yield robbing uh, disease. And in Alberta, we're, we're still, quite frankly, still learning about it. And on that note, it's a great time to mention we have a lot of these agronomic topics we are continuously covering on our canola school. As I said today, Tonight's show is brought to you by Adama Canada, Decisive Farming by TELUS Agriculture and the Canola School on Real Agriculture. From preceding seeder setup and checks to pest identification and advice on nutrient management decisions to tips on determining swath timing, Real Agriculture's Canola School is a video series that tackles every facet of the canola growing season in an engaging and informative format. Visit canolaschool.com and thanks to our Canola School sponsor, Invigor Hybrid Canola by BASF. 
So yes, that is a huge library. Go check it out, canolaschool.com. I know Keith has made an appearance numerous times. And uh, now that we have taken Michelle as a victim, we are going to put her on our schools as well. So always great. Send us your ideas. We love to uh, chat all things agronomy. But we are unfortunately out of time. So any last uh, parting words, Michelle or Keith? The one thing that I will mention that um, I forgot earlier, but something that gets forgotten a lot in the fall here in Ontario is our new seeding stands. So new seeding hay fields that went in in August after wheat. I know sometimes these get overlooked because they're usually green and growing and look lovely, but I tend to see them in the spring with a lot of volunteer wheat in there. So if you have got a straight alfalfa new seeding, we still have got time yet this fall to get out there and spray off the volunteer wheat. So don't forget about your forages. Those are my parting words. <laughs> okay, awesome. Keith? Just always keep scouting. Uh, when uh, when I heard I could talk to you about scouting, I was, I was in, Kara, because I push scouting any time of the year. Fall soil sampling is a great time to get another look at your field. There are some new 4R programming, some incentives out for growers to adopt best management practices. So I'll put in a plug for that, regardless of which uh, provider or which 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 uh, which company, which which organization might be uh, might be eligible to provide that to you. Uh, consider consider that as you're doing your fall soil sampling. But anytime you're in the field, see how you can be a student of the crop that you've grown or the crop that you're going to be growing. Okay. Well, thank you both very much for joining me tonight. It is uh, always, like I said, great to uh, chat agronomy and I appreciate the different perspectives across uh, Canada. And thank you very much to our uh, guests, everyone that was commenting. It is so great to see your guys' interaction. I've missed doing live with you guys. So thank you very much. And one last shout out. Thank you very much to our sponsors, to Adam at Canada, Decisive Farming by TELUS Agriculture and the Canola School for being tonight's show sponsors. Everybody have a great night and Lindsay Smith will be back in the host seat next Monday.